Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to episode, are you ready for this, Bob? 136. Oh my God. I know. Um, January the 11th, I said, on your email, I think you said January the 11th it goes out. Yes, yeah. Um, So the title of this is Blind Spots in Therapy. Okay. Interesting title. Mm. So are we recording as we speak? We are recording as we speak. It's all systems go, Bob. Okay. Blind spots in therapy. Before I go on about blind spots in therapy, um, I I would have said it in the last podcast, but I hope you all had a good new year and you are enjoying yourself, especially as you're listening to this podcast. I, I hope you are. Okay. Blind spots in therapy. So when you think of blind spots in therapy, Jackie, what do you think of? I'm thinking why you speak about so. <laughs> maybe what potentially gaps in our knowledge. Do you mean the therapist and the client, or both? Um, both, both maybe. Hmm. Yeah. So when you say that, what comes next in your thinking then? Um, okay. around that. Yeah. Maybe personal bias, maybe that's a good one because I think that's something that both the the therapist and the client has. You mean prejudice? Yeah. Frames of reference. Yes. Yeah. Filtering out certain things, our personal beliefs and all that sort of stuff. And also leads to counter transference, doesn't it? And yes. trans issues. Yeah. 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 That's how I see it when we talk about blind spots in therapy. It's certainly around um both people's frames of reference so where so as you know and i think i've said on these podcasts i do all the assessments of the institute so people ring up and want half an hour assessment with me um that's fine and we go ahead with that and then i pass them on to one of the therapists would suit them there's about 30 therapists at the institute and my part of my job is to match people up but one of the things i think about a lot and i believe is true is that therapy always works better if the therapist and the client get on with each other. I think therapy works better. So, in other words, they don't have to have equal frames of reference, um, but if they perhaps come from the same ballpark, then they're more likely, if you like, that's not always the case, but in terms of a sort of thumb rule, to, to sort of get on with people. Yeah. So um, that's important to think about, as is the cultural implications. Yeah. People, you know, uh, they don't always have to, therapists and clients don't always have the same cultural processes, I know. But it's something I think about in terms of cultural compatibility, if you want to put it that way. And I think it's the same blind spot, you see. If people come from different frames of reference or different types of script which we'll get onto in a minute yeah might be more likely to have blind spots which would include things like prejudice being things being outside of their awareness um it leads on to transference issues of course so i think the time to match people up uh i think in terms of reference cultural implications are important to think of in terms of effective psychotherapy there's a fine line in there I think with you know finding a therapist that you've got things in common with and then over identification (laughs) there's there's kind of a you know a nice area in the middle maybe Mm, mm, mm. but there's a chance of crossing over on that I think there's always that dilemma yeah uh, what well, you're talking about that where you get sort of over or you might get over identification uh, versus you know blind spots or versus incompatibility yeah um, different terms of references 
So it's important to think about it that way. Um, now, we've talked about the idea of script a lot, haven't we? Yes, we have. Podcast where for people who perhaps haven't been on these podcasts before or haven't listened to us, when we define a script, it really comes from TA theory, but when we define script or that term, it means an unconscious life plan decided early on with a beginning, middle, end, really. I think Byrne changed his definition, but unconscious life plan will do for me. Yeah. And then what we do is we fit other people into the way that we think about ourselves, other people in the world. So if you think about it from that frame, you will surround yourself with people that will fit into your script. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So when you do couples therapy, one of the things I think about as a therapist is how the couples have interlocking scripts or don't. So people, as they go on in life, according to the decisions they've made about themselves and other people, will pick friends to fit into their own script yeah. and surround themselves with people who fit into their own way of thinking, if you like. Yeah. When you're talking like this, it sounds like when we're picking people to fit into our script, that life runs very smoothly. But that's not always the case. No, and I'll tell you why it's not always the case. And they, because often we make our decisions um, and develop our script uh, in a survival mechanism. Yeah. So in other words, the more dysfunctional, unhealthy the um, environment that the person has been brought up into will be determining factor. Yeah. Making the decisions which form the hub of their script. Yeah. Now, as that as they continue on in life and grow up, and that script may be part of their personality, they continue to pick people, or may do, that fit into those early survival decisions. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm okay. You're not okay. I'm okay. You are okay. Um, you know those existential life positions. Now, sometimes it could be more detailed than that, but it's very, very elementary in some ways. So as the person grows up, they may move into areas or meet people where those ways of thinking or coping actually brings them more challenges than uh, they thought they might. So in other words, maybe those coping mechanisms, those early decisions need, up, need updating or at least revised and reflected on so they can find more healthy decisions now they've moved away from their dysfunctional heritage. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, I always think that our script, it, it's familiar even though it can be negative. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, so picking the wrong people to be around that puts us in a, a, a bad you know, state of mind a lot of the time can be part of our script. Definitely. Yeah. I come to therapy and just may say, well, I know things are wrong or I don't feel happy or I feel hopeless or I feel depressed and I can't get out of it. Or I feel um, not you know, like malcontent in life or whatever it is. And quite often they're, keep into this script, which was a survival script early on in life, but actually has become more like a burden around their neck yeah. because of their unhappiness in life. And so they go to a therapist and if the therapist, you know, thinks about scripts or thinks about the idea about the past effects and the present, they will help the person explore their earlier life and the decisions they made and whether those decisions are useful anymore in a diff in the different situation 20 years later. Yeah. Now, if that, and it usually is, where those early decisions actually aren't helpful anymore, then the therapist will help them put the past and the present together and develop a new type of script and put, help them put that on the road. Yeah, an updated version. 
updated version. Now that takes time. It's not Absolutely. Like yeah. But when we talk about blind spots in therapy, those blind blind spots are often created out of the script that the person's decided on in these difficult circumstances. Or, and therefore, those blind spots, if we want to call them blind spots in this way, so that's, they're certainly outside their awareness, will continue. Yeah. Until... Um, life events happen where those blind spots lead the person to have such a distressful quality of life that they turn up in therapy or people may confront them or or whatever yeah i think for me one of the things that happens a lot with clients is they'll come because of repeated patterns yeah they're doing the same thing over and over in different relationships. Hmm. And that's what kind of brings them that this always happens to me. That's right. Whatever that is. Yeah. So an example I might give of what blind spot we're talking about, um, you know, is that somebody believes that, you know, all Scot everybody that lives in Scot Scotland or Scottish are mean. Yeah. Well, you know, when you think about that, that means that they might never go to Scotland. Yeah. They may never surround themselves with people who come from Scotland. Uh, they think of Scot Scottish people as mean, not okay people. And so their life, in effect, is quite narrow. Yeah. Now, if they keep with that belief system and they meet somebody they didn't know came from Scotland, fell in love with them or really, and then they find out they come from Scotland, You've got a problem on your hands, haven't you? Yeah. It's a, perhaps an extreme example, but it's an example of what we're talking about here, that their blind spot, which you might want to call prejudice if you want, yeah. has led them down a line where their life is more narrower, unfulfilled, um, than if they saw the world in, in what is actually, what we're talking about here is an updated belief system needs uh changing if you like yeah yeah absolutely a blind spot becomes part of a script decision that, that gets played out and doesn't help that person yeah which or, for me as well links into you know another blind spot being lack of self-awareness yeah when we're not aware that we have these prejudices or that we've got these you know parts of our script or whatever which again you know i know we do this in ta about having our own personal therapy so hopefully we've kind of worked through a lot of things and we are a lot more self-aware mm -hmm. so uh you know big boy you know boys shouldn't cry yeah we could give lots of examples yeah i call prejudice or decisions made outside people's awareness but they're usually made because they've been passed down by their significant other people, or they're made in terms of protecting themselves. Yeah. And the, the blind spots, because they're in our subconscious, we don't consciously know that they're there. It's not something that, you know, we're aware of half of the time until it presents itself somehow in front of us. So these belief systems, which are clearly prejudiced to other people, yeah, need updating. In yeah. fact, that might be harmful in some ways. Um, the person who's got the blind spot, A, isn't aware of it, and B, will hang on to that contaminated process or that prejudice for dear life because it was made so such a long time ago and it's linked to their identity and yeah. predictability in life. So they're not, so they won't easily give that up. Yeah. I had a conversation this week with a client and we were talking about affirmations and I kind of, every so often I'll post on social media and I put three affirmations and she sent me a message and she said, it's really funny but I said those affirmations and two of them, I had a reaction to them. 
I was saying it, but I felt like it wasn't true. And I, that to me is exactly what we're talking about, that it's that deep rooted. We don't even know it's there until somebody crosses the line or it's brought to our attention. Very, very true. So somebody walks in for therapy, um, they're 33 years of old age, and they've just had kids, and the kids now are two or three, let's say. And they say, you know, I, I, I'm in trouble because my marriage is not work, working. I've just had children, and uh, my partner uh, believes my parenting is not very good, and doesn't help the the, the quality of you know life for them, for their children. Um, anyway, after a few more sessions, we invite in the husband or partner, and he says, yes, it's terrible. She insists on making sure that the kids go to bed far earlier than they should do. And, and you know, she, she doesn't see them as important at all. And then you turn to the woman and the woman says, that's just not true. I mean, I love them very dearly and we play a lot in XXXX. And as we go further into the conversation, we find out that one of her belief systems, which was not only passed down to her, but she believed was reality, was kids should be seen and not heard. Because as a child, not only was that passed down to her, but she, she, you know, was treated in ways where she wasn't important as a child. Uh, and she's carrying on with the same decision as yeah. if it was a reality. So her own kids, if she carried on with this, would have the same, you know, implications that they would probably feel not important, yeah, that they would feel not heard, that they would feel their values are not to be esteemed as useful. And the father, of course, didn't have those, didn't have that just thought process, those belief systems and could see the damage that was happening. And so we had some therapy happening, yeah, not only between the, both of them, but for her on these out of awareness blind spots. That yeah. Were... Yeah. I think, you know, if we, we go into therapy, thinking that we've got all our bases covered and things like this won't actually come up as part of the therapeutic process, I think we're we're on to a loser. <laughs> yeah, we're on to a loser, definitely, because we have scripts which are made out of survival reasons um, with our significant other people or parents. Yeah. They have their own scripts. And it's almost like a generational yeah. potato process. And then we come into the world, meet other people with different scripts or similar scripts, and then we're into these challenges in relationships. I love that. I'm not sure whether people would have picked up on that. The hot potato, literally, it's it's like a game. I'm not sure whether it's just a, a British game that we play where you catch the ball and you have to pass it on as quick as you can. And a lot of the time, that's what our belief systems are based on. They come from our parents. We just pick it up without question and then we throw it on. And it is generational. And a solution, Jackie, therapeutically, is to enable uh, the client um, and empowered enough to hand back the hot potato where it came from. Oh, it's a big one, that one, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean it's a big one? I'm mean... saying that because I've literally... <laughs> The, this past few weeks had a personal experience of this and it is really difficult to hand it back. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Do you mean difficult in psychologically? Is that what you mean? Yeah. It, it, to let something that I feel is, is part of me go, that it's it's not mine, so I can let it go. But when you've lived with it for 57 years... <laughs> it feels intrinsically part of me when my logical brain knows it's not, it's passed down from my mum, 100%. So giving 
back that hot potato or that process feels like part of yourself is going yeah and it, it's it's the scariness of being in a world without it i'll get i'll tell you what it is bob just so that you you, you kind of can, can be clear on my oncologist i need to have a conversation with my oncologist where i'm questioning his decisions and it feels really really uncomfortable <clears throat> for me to do that and i know that that comes from my mum because we don't question people in authority or professional people there's a blind spot then but you but, but you've become conscious of it absolutely yeah more importantly you have become conscious of where that belief systems come from absolutely and i had a conversation with my mum about it as well <laughs> uh, i wonder if it went back to her mum and dad but that's interesting yeah but it, 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 it was one of those things that as soon as I realised what I was doing and the fear that I had about this conversation that I need to have, I knew straight away where it, it came from. I, I can't look a police officer in the eye, do you know what I mean? Because I always feel guilty. It's, it's, it's literally people of status rank a lot higher than me in my family. So... Have you decided what you're going to do about this then? Yeah, I'm going to put my big girl pants on. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and what? And have a conversation with my oncologist next week yeah. when I need to see him. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the end of the day, um, I believe your own, you know, beliefs and values are just as important as his or hers. Yeah, that would be a psychological example of passing the hot potato back. Yeah, I meant it pass, passing back to the mother, but of course you talked about the mother. And the next thing, of course, would be to action out what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and you know, for me personally, I'm I'm sure you've had it as well, Bob. When I'm going through something myself, everything seems a lot clearer. Do you know what I mean? When we're trying to explain it to a client, if we've got an example where we can kind of explain it to them so that they hopefully get an understanding of what we mean, because a lot of this is kind of, it's a bit out there, isn't it? Unless we can use a metaphor or an example, it's it's hard to explain sometimes. It is, and here's one then. Um, if, some, if some parent or significant other person um, early in childhood, where the power dynamic is loaded towards the significant other person tells the other the child either in words or non-verbal behaviors you are stupid yeah you're stupid you're stupid you're stupid they will change the you into an i yeah so and they own it yeah becomes the you becomes an i therefore i am stupid yeah and that becomes their belief system. And you're correct earlier in the podcast when you said out of awareness, because what becomes out of awareness is where the message, where the message started. So you feel as if your belief system is, a, you know, from you. Yeah. Actually, the belief system comes from somewhere else. And this is very, very, very common when we're talking about shame. Yes. Yeah. True. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. They have these belief systems. This is all about themselves. And, and it's because they've been overdefined. They've been told certain messages which actually aren't true. They've turned the you to an I. And then they believe X. Yeah. Instead of what is the real reality. Yeah. And I think it's really important what you said as well, Bob, that sometimes this isn't you know, verbally, directly told to us. It's the non-verbal insinuations within families and, and how we're treated and all that sort of stuff that we pick this up. It's very right. rare, I think, that a parent directly says this sort of stuff to us. Absolutely true. If a child, an infant is born into a family where the mother is depressed so that they're in bed most of the day, Yeah or they aren't able some of the time to look after the infant because they're so low or they feel so down 
uh, and they stay in bed or they can't be joyful with the infant or the infants uh, will receive information about their mother or significant other which is um, they're not being looked after or they're not being played or they're not being fed all these things because the parent um, isn't able to move away from their depression then the infant will make a decision about that and they may make a decision which says something like well i'm obviously not okay because the other person this is the, is the mother in the case isn't playing with me yeah. it is. but it is in response to the non-verbal yeah messages of which is almost passed on by osmosis yeah yeah of in this case depressed mother yeah I'm not enough, I'm not worthy, all those sorts of things that affects our self-worth, our self-esteem and everything going forward, absolutely. You say it's so out of awareness, if you want to put it that way, um, that we start to believe fundamentally what was said, what was decided, as if it was about ourselves. Yeah. So then what might actually happen later in childhood is that we start as we grow up, we start to act depressed, just like our mother who passed the hot potato of depression down. Yeah, depression is often modeled. Yeah, anxiety is as well, I think. Anxiety is often modeled. Yeah, it's one of the things you, I can remember having a conversation with my sister who suffers a lot from anxiety. She made an awful lot of assumptions that her daughter who had anxiety had the same anxiety as what she did <laughs> and I, I can remember saying to her you can't say that because everybody's different your anxiety is your anxiety and hers is hers don't assume that she's scared of the same things that you are absolutely so these become blind spots yeah people have because they've decided things a long time ago to survive and often they're not true absolutely because they're built on a different reality than the common reality. Yeah. Now, the other thing about blind spots for therapists and for clients is in the world of transfers. Yeah. Projections. So all of us, every all of us, live in the world of projections. Yeah. So we project something and say, oh, well, that person's not thinking well of me. They're not smiling or they're frowning or something must be wrong. So we project out our fears, thoughts onto the other person. Yeah, that's what I mean by projections. Yeah. Um, projections are the glue for transference. And transference is another world altogether, which is built on assumptions and built on a bilateral sense of communication where we're thinking and feeling what the other person's, you know, is like, usually built on um our experiences from the past. Yeah. Which we then transfer onto the therapist. Now, if we're talking about counter transference, it'll be who is the client for the therapist? And then therapist through projection, or, or we use the word transference if you like, will transfer onto the client something actually which isn't real at all, but has a basis in their own history. Yeah. That is the ground for blind spots. And this is where it gets really complicated in the therapy room. It's like it the matrix. There's so many different layers of things that are going yeah. on. Because actually what's happening is both parties often are trying to resolve issues which aren't in the present at all. Yeah. They have their etiology in the past. Yeah. 99% of the stuff that goes on there isn't in the present. It's got one foot in the past <laughs> or the future, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you, you, you're a therapist and you've been adopted, for example, I mean, your area is fostered, if you like, and in comes a client and the issues they want to work on is lost bereavement with adoption and foster. Yeah. Well, therefore, the therapist has a whole history around that. And they've come to decisions about all those issues you just talked about through experience and then out of awareness they may transfer over their own historical experience in connection with what we we're just talking about yeah onto the client who 
may not have had those experiences at all, even though they lived in a similar world. Yeah, yeah. And then therapy goes down the wrong way. Yeah. All right, blind spots. In that situation, as a the therapist, would you bring that up? Well, the different therapists are going to respond different ways. But as you're asking me, <laughs> um, I think it would depend on timing and the timing and awareness in the psychotherapy process. In other words, if it was right at the beginning, yeah, when the working relationship hasn't really been formed. Probably not, because it's too early for um, that type of confrontation. The relationship isn't might, might not be strong enough to hold that. I'll call it confrontation, but that challenge. So, you know, I'm if I'm going to talk about transference or talk about my own history being projected onto the other, all those things. I, I think I would only start to go down that direction if the relationship with the client was strong enough to be able to take that type of intervention. Yeah. So whatever I did would be, my first thought would be, is this in the client's best service clinically? Yeah. For me to share this. Yeah. It's a really interesting topic. Yeah, because if you choose to share something like your own history, so, you know, I've been thinking about this because of my own history, and actually I might be projecting some of my own stuff on you, um, and I've been thinking about this, and I wanted to say this to you because um, it might not be your own history. You wouldn't do that in the first few sessions. No, no, absolutely not, no. You might do that 10 sessions in. So you'd have to think about, and the other thing you'd have to think about is why you were doing it in the first place. Yeah. It has to be for the client's best interest. But there's also something about, you know, if if we are so aware of the transference and counter-transference that's going on, if we, if we can't work through that, that we need sometimes to refer a client on. Oh, you know, op- absolutely. I don't think people should be working with people. Let's give, let's let's give the example I gave. So somebody has been adopted or fostered and then a client walks in the door and they want to work on adoption issues or fostered issues. If the therapist hasn't worked through all their issues regarding to what we're talking about here and it, and is not in a place where they can come from adult rather than their own child or parent, they definitely shouldn't take them on in the first place. Yeah. The unfortunate thing with some clients is that they spring things on us <laughs> weeks down the line. <laughs> they are in a difficult position because it's like if they spring things on, say, three or four months, six months on, then you've got to weigh up the ethicality of this. Yeah. Because they've built a good relationship with you. And how, whether it's for the best of the client to refer them on or whether that's going to fracture the relationship or not. Yeah, yeah. So it's, there's a lot in that, what you yeah. just but I think the world of transference, you know, is a, for me, is a fertile ground for the emergence of blind spots. Yeah. And it's, you know, to just bring this episode to a close, I think the important thing is to, to be aware of the fact that we have blind spots. Oh, everybody does. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's like... Yeah, just knowing that they're there and being aware of what our blind spots potentially are. Yeah. There's certain clients that I won't take on because I know my knowledge, I haven't got enough knowledge around it. And I think we really, before we finish, I think a really important plea is for supervision. Yes, yeah. Your own therapy, but certainly supervision. Because the, it, because for lots of reasons, but you have a, a, a another level of protection put in there. And yeah. another level of eyes, which is above the transferential matrix, which can help the person move their out of awareness blind spot into more of a sort of seen reality. Yeah. So until next time, Bob. Interesting subject that, though, isn't it? Yes. And the, the podcast title that we're going to follow on 
to, I think, you know, links in with this. It's the danger of assumption in the therapy process. Oh, my gosh. Well, I won't assume too much, and I'll look forward to <laughs> conversation next week. Okie dokie. Until next time, Bob. Thank you. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.